So my name is uh, Dina Barrett, and as uh, David said, I'm from Zoom Web Services. Can everyone hear me? Yeah. Okay. And uh, this is just a little bit of biography about me. Um, I've been about around the block a bit. Um, uh, some, some, some people know me, some people don't. Um, from my perspective, um, I focus in the UK mostly um, developing high computer systems, so highly available computer systems. Um, I also try and encourage the global partnerships around the EMEA as well. And so I'd like to today talk about uh, another part of my role which I'm very, very passionate about. Um, we belong to a research and technical computing team and we've, Amazon has invested quite heavily over the last several years in scientific computing. And we have lots of team members. We have team members from um, X Boeing, which is what I am, X NASA, I'm X NASA as well. Um, we focus on genomics. Um, we even have a rocket scientist uh, part of our research team. Does anyone know anything about Amazon apart from the fact that you buy stuff off there? Does anyone? <laughs> no? Okay. I want to keep it a little bit interactive because it can get quite tedious. My slides, they are long, just to warn you. Uh, but if you, what, I mean, so you know what cloud computing is, right? Yeah? Okay, good. All right. So we've got a long history. So we started out um, with Amazon. And as you can see, we just were selling books, we were also selling decorative clothes. And when we first started out, it was just to support the retail platform. It wasn't to support um, other infrastructures at all. And over the years, what we've seen is uh, demand for compute. So as we started out, we started creating our own data center because we just didn't have the infrastructure in place. So we developed our infrastructure. But so what we realized as well that we had additional capacity and we thought, what the hell do we do with additional capacity? So we thought, well, maybe we can make it available to our customers. And so now, fast forward into 2016, we have over, um, I know this is a sales plug, but this is the last one you hear of it. We have over about 990 million customers using Amazon.com so, and Amazon Web Services. So the important thing to remember about AWS is that we've got AWS.com, right, that is the infrastructure services, and then it's our Amazon.com. A lot of people think AWS is Amazon. It's not. We've got two separate, distinct companies. Over the years, what's happened in terms of our geographic spread is that we expanded worldwide. And right now, um, we've got 38 availability zones around the world, and we have 14 regions. We have 40, 54 endpoints, uh, points of presence, and we're growing rapidly. This year, end of the year, next quarter, next year, um, we're going to see a London data centre and then followed by Montreal and several other data centers. So you want to know more, there's more on our website. I don't really want to talk about our global infrastructure. We want to talk about it's what we do for high performance computing. And, but this is relevant as well to what we do. What, what I want you to look at is our platform. So there's a lot of services. We've got over, and let me just get the number that I dug out yesterday. We have over 2,200 services and functions, 70, over 70 core services. Everything from, as you can see, I can't see that, everything from the platform services, so platform as a service, from development tools, then you have infrastructure services in terms of the network that we have, the core storage. So our AWS is based on, on, on fundamentals such as the compute, we have storage, we have database, we have analytics, we have many application deployment services. And I mean, it will take me another few hours just to go through the services with you, but it's a very broad, rich platform of services that's been developed since 2006. And the reason why we have all these services is because of you guys. You guys come to us and say, we need this service. So because we develop at such a hyperscale level, we have many, many customers, a lot of enterprise customers, and they kind of dictate to us to a point 
what we develop. But we listen to all our customers, we listen to our research facilities, we, research, we listen to our universities that are partnering with us, we listen to all the academic institutions and all the laboratories that we support worldwide. And we come up with a platform to support not just scientific computing, but also genomics, life sciences, environmental science, uh, semiconductor analysis, I mean, you name it, those workloads are actually on AWS. There are some things I can't talk about because they're not public reference yet, but if you want to have those conversations, you can with me under NDA, okay? And so let's move on to like, what is research computing. So AWS has, um, I would say, and I know Kenji might disagree with this, right? But I think we've got the broadest collection of like services that from any cloud provider, and you can actually see from our platform. Um, what I want to focus on is what we've been doing over the last several years. And we're known as a disruptor because we're not a typical infrastructure, we're not a typical IT um, company. You know, we're retail, and from retail, we spawned AWS. So we became this disruptor, and we, saw, and we innovate on a large scale. I mean, we, we encompass agile technologies, and we have innovations every single day. And if you look at some of the updates that happen on our website, you'll see that we're generating new innovations every single day, new releases every single day. So it's really fast-paced working at AWS. And because of this disruptor, um, and leading this disruptor cycle, we're seeing also that we've launched, and this new service that we've launched, we are disrupting a lot of traditional ways of doing things, like traditional ways of analysis, traditional ways of moving forward in terms of computation. Um, we have alliances with NASA, we have alliances with Jefferson, we have alliances with Airbus, we have alliances with Boeing. We even partner with Microsoft, right? So there are partners, but yet we're competitors as well. And what's important to note that if you think about disrupting science, um, and the reason why we're changing science is because we're not a typical um, you know, IT establishment. We, and if you think about some of the disruptors um, in his, historical uh, disruptors, if you think about uh, smartphones, that's kind of disruptive, isn't it, to personal computers, for example. Um, if you think about, for example, your personal computers, that disrupted microcomputers, workstations, and, and word processors. And so you come to AWS, what did we disrupt? Well, we disrupted industry. So you th have you heard of Uber? Anyone heard of Uber? Right. That's a disrupted industry. I mean, who would think of creating an application we call a taxi? Who would think that, right? If you think about Airbnb, heard of Airbnb? Right. They rent out your rooms. That's a disruptor in, in, in the industry, in the hotel industry. You should go to a hotel, book a room, and you get a room. You can book a room through your you know, mobile app, and it's someone's house that you book a room in. So you kind of disrupted the, the concept of what we thought we knew. And so we, we've moved forward from that. You know, if you think about supercomputing, you know, Cray, supercomputers. And, and you were able to use the supercomputers anywhere else apart from if you're a government or your research lab or, an, or a university. And so it wasn't really affordable to the masses. Um, and if you wanted to use a supercomputer for data analytics, um, it would cost you, how much do you think it would cost? Give me a number. Millions. Millions? My last estimate from the top 500 uh, listing online, if you go then have a look, it's between 100 million and 250 million for design and assembly, and that does not include maintenance costs. So if you wanted that kind of compute power, that's how much it's going to cost you. So again, it wasn't open to the masses, was it? And so from that, that disrupted technology. Another person disrupted the way we um, think about computing is, is uh, Linus Tavalda. You all heard of him? Yeah. yeah. How do you think he disrupted technology? David, you, not you. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, no. You can, you can maybe encourage the audience participation if uh, everybody, nobody wants to speak up. <laughs> so Linus is the, I think personally, is the most influential inventor of open source uh, and competed against Windows, right? 
And, and, if, and for the past like 25 years, you know, if you think about Linux, it's everywhere. It's on your phone, it's on your smarts, it's, it's available everywhere, uh, every device that you touch. And, and if you think about uh, Linux, it's free, it's open source, and it's incredibly capable, right? So he is a disruptor in the way we used to compute. And so when Linux became available, things rapidly changed. And from that spawned the BeWolf cluster. Anyone heard of that? Yeah. yeah. What do you know about the BeWolf cluster? Do you think we compute like that now? No? I remember when I was doing research in the lab about several years ago, there, were, there was a cluster just like this. And I was shocked, totally shocked. Um, but I suppose if you, if you think about it, the reason why you know you've got people's cluster because commodity computing was available, just get a bunch of computers and plug them together and you've got your set cluster. But then you're restricted, aren't you? You're restricted in, in what the compute power that you have, right? And so if you've got large data sets that you want to process, you can do any analytics, it would take you not an hour or a day weeks, months, potentially even a year, right? And so that was disrupted by cloud. And I'm not really going to go into cloud because David covered that. So how else did we disrupt um, computing? Well, we came up with serverless architecture. So the service that we launched was Lambda. And, you know, the cloud now is, in my opinion, it is known as supercomputer. Serverless lets us program it. So from my perspective, Lambda will allow you to use all the resources I have in a cloud without actually, you know, in, I would say executing those resources. It's done automatically. So with Lambda, you've got no services to manage uh, or service manage. It's continuous scaling. And you, you never pay for idle time. So if you think about getting a supercomputer or a computer, you're going to use it for bursts, right, in your timeline. When you schedule your job, you do your job and it ends. But then with, if you buy a computer on premise, you're continuously paying for that server. So any unused capacity is just, you're just wasting your money. With, in terms of Lambda, you're not, because you don't pay for a cold server. You don't pay for that. You only pay for what you use. And so in terms of use cases that I've used Lambda for, I've used data processing. Um, I've built out serverless uh, app ecosystems in Python where we're taking large amounts of seismic data from the geographical uh, society and process that data using Lambda. You've all heard of Jupyter, right? Who uses Jupyter? Okay, right. Uh, yes, you can use Jupyter, yeah. And so, yes, yeah, web app that allows you to create and share documents, yeah, and you can do a lot of things, code equations, visualizations, whatnot on there. But what if you can take that from your laptop to a server, and from a server to a cluster, and from a CPU to a GPU? What if you could do that? We can do that on AWS. We've got the resources available for you to do that. We've got an, we've got an AMI, which is an Amazon machine image that has got Jupyter notebook actually loaded on there, and you can use those resources. And you can have connectivity from your laptop to the online resource as well. And so the other thing that, in terms of disruption, how we're changing the way we process data and how we look at science um, overall is that we've made public data sets available online. Uh, and this is really important because at, before, I mean, if you're trying to get a public data set, I remember when I was doing research, it's really hard to get that data set. Uh, and now it's actually available online. And this is just a sample of what's actually available. There, there is a link at the bottom public data sets, and you have everything from, um, for example, I'll just give you a list of stuff that I actually pulled out, Landsat's data, you've got, for example, Spacenet, you've got terrain tiles, GDELT, um, you've got um, Nextrad, NASA, and the list goes on. Now, if you think about um, these large data sets, um, before, if, if, if the old ways of processing, if, if, if you were processing something like human genome, for example, it required uh, like days and days and days to locate the data itself, right? And then you had to compile that data, you got a bottle of data, and then you've got to set up the processing, right? And, and, this, and so on. Well, this data set's already there, and in some cases, you'll also find that the models are already there as well. So it's easier now to actually process 
and develop your models with the data sets that are available. So what does this mean? So this means that we collaborate. Now, what's this map showing you, guys? What's it showing you? Who will speak at once? <laughs> Is it? So it so Whatever it says in the bottom left-hand corner. Right. What, what do we do as, uh, as scientists? We collaborate, don't we, with our teams. It's just not a mayor, is it? We collaborate worldwide. So if you look at the map, look at North America, right? Look at South America. Look at the concentration of collaboration there, right? Then let's go down to the east here, where we've got Australia. Let's look at the collaboration there. Where's the highest amount of collaboration going on? The highest number of lines and colours, bright colours, right in the middle, right? So collaboration is key. Now, bear this in mind, when we think about AWS with our 38 availability zones, our 14 regions, right? This, if you look at the map, collaboration is actually easy in the cloud. And because we've got this huge data center footprint around the world, collaboration allows <laughs> you to talk to one another, share that data with other researchers worldwide. So now let's get into some real technical stuff. And if, if I'm going, too deep, please let me know. I tend to do that, All right? Um, so let's have a look at what we have and what helps to process. So we're on Amazon, we've got instance families and we have families based on um, the alphabet. So we've got T2, M, M versions, C versions, the R family, the P2 family, the C family. So let's deep down some more. So let's have a look at these families of high performance computers that we have. Okay. So the C the C four eight texture large is the most popular server that we have that's used by academic institutions, our customers, businesses, big data processing, machine learning, um, those those, are, those environments are created and you, those servers are created and those environments that were developed, the models are just on using those, that same type of computer. Now, if you look at the c 4 h large, you've got virtual 36 CPUs and you've got 18 cores per bat and you've got 2.5 gigahertz. Now, AWS has the latest Haswell CPU. And the Haswell CPU was developed by Intel just for AWS, right? And each C486 or large, right, has two physical CPU sockets with three gigabyte per core capacity. Now, you've also got like a bursting option as well. So, for example, um, you're at 2.5 gigahertz. If you need to burst, you could do a turbo up to 3.5 gigahertz. That's one of the reasons why it's so popular, because it's a very, very powerful computer. Um, we follow the Intel roadmap really, really closely. Uh, and one of the benefits that we have is that, you know, when they, when, because we're following that roadmap, we're able to release new technology and update, update the entire technology uh, very quickly, and then migrate those changes across the families that you see above. And when we, when we make these upgrades, we don't pass on the cost to you guys, we absorb them. And if, if you know anything about Amazon, basically Amazon Web Services, and we're transparent in our costs, we're transparent in our pricing, and we always try to reduce our costs over time. So since 2006, we've had 55 price reductions, and we continue to try and drive those costs down. And, and our prices are really, really transparent. I mean, you go online, you have to look at them right now, how much you're gonna pay per hour. There's no hidden costs there. And that's how we like to keep it. But when we, when we invest in our infrastructure, that's, it's on a long-term basis, so they'll absorb, those costs get eventually get absorbed. Now, these, these uh, computers are also working on a, a innovation that we've created in AWS. Um, the network infrastructure is our own. We've got our own network stack. Um, and our network stack combines like the latest processors, but also our hardware level network virtualization has been developed by us. Um, so this allows all our customers 
to increase the throughput and reduce latency between the instances. But the reason why I'm saying this is because, you know, generally in a data centre you just have general network stack, right? You all know what I mean by that? Right? I'm not losing any of you. So we've jumped our own, basically, and, and the reason is because over the years we, we know that there's high demand for high performance, better throughput, right? Better bandwidth. And so we've also got our Elastic Network adapter, the new ENI that was, reduced, that was uh, released um, last year. And this enhances our networking. And so we're always trying to improve our network. We're always trying to improve performance. And uh, when we introduced the X1 instance, which is the, the one with the 60 terabyte memory, we also released last network adapter, the ENA. And you can think of the ENA as the next generation of enhanced networking. Um, so you have an, and the ENA is based on a network driver that has, um, is able to handle up to 20 gigabytes per second. And, along with, and this comes with features such as hardware, checksums, and um, server, side, server scaling as well. And in terms of what's available on the market right now, it's, it's, it's the most advanced CNA that is available right now. Now, why is this important? Does anyone know why this is important? Go on, I'll speak up. I know it's, I know it's all in the morning. You need some more coffee. <laughs> Do you know why it's important? David, why is this important? Because if you don't build it faster than that, people will be able to kill it. Right. It's a given, isn't it? If you think about it, right. So, based on that, so keep that in mind in terms of networking, I just want to talk to you about what we've actually done. So now I'm moving into a section where uh, I want to describe what kind of workloads are running on AWS. So, Schrodinger and Cycle Computing, um, we worked with them to process data for uh, 25,000 molecules. Um, and when they came to us, um, the cost they were seeing were into the millions. And, and we said, well, well, we can actually drop that. You, know, you don't really need, it's not going to cost you that much. So. Working with them, with eight regions around the world, um, we used uh, spot instances, which I'm going to talk about later on to reduce the cost, uh, to set up an environment where we, we could process this data. Um, when they did their estimation, it, in terms of computation, it was 264, as you can see, and it was done in 18 hours. Now, why is this important? Because Again, going back to the early conversation about disruption in technology, you know, before, you know, you had to wait such a long time to post your data, to create a model, to get results. And so instead of waiting months, years, hundreds of years, in fact, you can, you can, you can condense that down now into less than a month, less than a week, less than an hour. Some results I've generated are done in 30 minutes. Uh, and, and, and this is important because it's revolutionised the way we compute. It's revolutionised the way we process data. It's revolutionised the way we manage our scientific projects. Another example is a weather company um, that provides uh, millions of people every day with weather forecasts. Um, again, came to us to reduce their costs. And again, the main driver, if you think about these days, it is, you know, we all want scientific exploration, but the cost is there, and everyone's penny-pinching, everyone's trying to reduce their costs. And so a cost becomes a driver in most cases, even in research projects. In my projects I do, I get a set grant, and within that grant I have to, as you know, complete your research. But then in universities, as you know, the, the cost is kind of spread overhead, so you don't really know what you're paying for. But what if you had you, it was coming from your budget, right? You'd have to fall, really focus down and narrow down how much you're going to spend on, on research and processing. So this is where, in, in, for, for most companies, um, and I would say most businesses actually, you know, cost is a very, very big issue, and it's the actual driver for them. It's not research or knowledge is cost. And so with the weather company, um, they 
had a, a, a direction to migrate into a cloud-based solution. And the benefits that the benefits of moving is that they were they ingested like four gigabytes of data per second uh, from 800 very sources. And Amazon had infrastructure; it's all API based, all secure APIs, and so that made it very easy for them to use the API and adapt their applications to call those APIs. And they had basically designed the application uh, to handle more than 15 billion API calls um, each day at a rate of 150,000 per account. Now, the benefit of this is that it reduced their IT environment spend, it reduced their on-premise IT infrastructure from 13 data centers to six data centers. And then the ultimate benefits that they realized was they had better performance, more agile, it was more flexible because it can scale up and scale down. It was more reliable because it had a highly available infrastructure spread against multiple zones. Um, it was more scalable, more elastic, and it dropped their costs. Still with me? Okay, so let's have a look at something that's really more um, relevant to environmental sciences. So, Zooniverse, has anyone heard of Zooniverse? Right, okay. So they created the Planetary Response Network to support um, like relief efforts around the world. And um, it actually started when the Nepal earthquake in 2015. And the, and the universe knew uh, that you know, PRN would be really, really helpful. So PRN takes satellite data and um, like pre and post disaster and I use that data to inform like ground based rescue teams. So the universe aggregates up to 1.4 million volunteers. The data is for 1.4 million volunteers and 65 full time researchers to analyze all the data. Now they also use Sentinel 2 data which is available via Amazon S3. And it allows, uh, and when they use it, it allows them uh, within hours of production, uh, able to analyze that within hours of production. And all of the Sentinel 2 data has a lower spatial resolution, like 10, 10 meters. When compared to Planet Labs, which is three to five meters, it contains like, the multi spectral data. So, in terms of the support they provided, Universe benefited greatly. Um, in working with these partners, all the partners, ESA, Plant Labs, Universe, NASA, all are partnering with AWS. But they were able to get that data to the rescue teams within less than an hour, instead of waiting for days and days and days. So here's Universe, just a quick, and I won't really plug in them, I'm kind of really impressed, to be honest, with what they've done in terms of uh, how uh, we can influence rescue in disaster zones. And because it's run by volunteers, they're constantly updating the images. And so rescue teams can quickly know how, what kind of efforts they need to deploy. Um, the second example is, this is a project with NASA, a Head in the Clouds project. And this was for, for climate simulation. Now the project goal was to use the uh, National Geogra uh, Geospatial Intelligence Agency provided estimate, wanted to estimate the tree and bush uh, biomass of the entire arid and semi-arid zones uh, in the south side of Sahara. And what they also wanted to do was estimate the carbon stored in trees and bushes and uh, establish like a carbon baseline for later research uh, and the expected CO2 uptake on the south side of the Sahara. So this basically meant that um, they, were, they gathered that they, they acquired 3,120 scenes needed to be processed to create this um, vegetation index. And from that scene, and I'm just going to read out some of the stats here. Um, each scene was uh, 30,000 pixels by 30,000 pixels, right? So 30,000 30, data points. And each tile, there was 100 tiles, 
and each tile took 24 minutes to process, right? So if you've got 24 times 100, that's what, 2,400 minutes. So you're looking at uh, 40 hours of like, um, I would say clock hours to process that data. And how much of the data was it? Like about eight terabytes of data itself uh, to compute. And what they did was they created HPC cluster and uh, it basically um, was processed within a couple of hours, the huge amount of data, no kidding, right? Um, so if you look at this top image, the top image um, is basically the beginning of the project, and that was 20, this one here, 20 terabytes images. Um, and then at the bottom image right at the bottom shows uh, the, the images needed for the analysis, which is 80, ter 80 terabytes. So further on, in terms of understanding what they were seeing, the, the, each dark spot here represents a possible tree or bush. Uh, you also can include shadows, as you can see, of a tree or bush, which, which uh, has to be removed for accurate estimate of, uh, how, much carbon, of, of the, uh, how much carbon it sequesters. So using multispectral mapping, uh, um, the data, uh, what they did was it showed the images and then it also showed, yep, it also showed the images, but also showed the, the amount of carbon. And so how did they, how did they process this data? They used 200 spot instances for the data processing. How many hours do you think it took to do this? All right, six hours. How much did it cost? $80. And the reason why it cost that much is because they ran it continuously and they only paid for what they used and then they shut the servers off. So that was it. Um, what I want to say about um, AWS and, and, and the way we move with scientific computing is that we have a lot of tools available. Um, has anyone actually seen the AWS Marketplace? It's a bit like the App Store. You go online, download stuff. Well, you can go into AWS App Store and download stuff. Uh, this is one of the stuff that's actually available. It's actually the Alsys uh, Supercomputing, I would say AMI. And I really like this server, and yeah, I'm a little bit biased because I work for AWS, but the reason why I like this service is for all the tool sets that I like to see um, in, in, a, in a server. And so, and the other thing is as well, that Flight is always accessible at the command line. So you've got the visual nice GPU they can use, you can use a nice visual interface. But from my perspective, I like working through a um, command line interface. Um, it allows you to directly connect up to that server. And Flight, and I don't know if anyone's actually used Flight itself. Um, Flight is used to collaborate. And so if you look at this console here, this image here, so when you bring up Flight, you have this dashboard. And with dashboard, you can add uh, collaborators to that dashboard. So you can collaborate with anyone in the world if they're running the same server. So you over here, you know, you can do work do your assessments, do your modeling, get your results. You know, eight hours later in Seattle, they'll be waking up, the data's right there for them to do the next level of research, the next level of results. And so it's useful to know this because there's a, there's a lot of resources available on AWS, but this is specifically geared for scientific processing and, and uh, high performance computing. So with me? Okay. So we're going to come up to the fun pin in a minute, and then I'm going to go into a boring bit as well, so I'm sorry about that. But just, just so you know, um, in Marketplace, you've got uh, BGFS and Lustre available as well. Um, and then you also have demo time. Okay, are you ready? All right. So hopefully, um, I can still uh, do this. So I've got a few minutes. And what I want to do is create a cluster, right, into a live cluster. So I want to show you the AWS console. And, and if you've not used a console before, this is basically what you'll see as soon as you log in and create a separate account. Uh, as, you, as you can see, multiple, uh, multiple services. And what I want to do right now is create a cluster using the CFN cluster framework that exists for HPC computing. 
So I'm going to quit the cluster right now. And I'm going to kick that cluster off and I'm going to carry over the presentation. And so we have automated tools to create clusters for you. It's called CloudFormation. So I'm going to go here, show you CloudFormation. And CloudFormation uses JSON to create a cluster. And what does JSON look like? JSON looks like this. So this is my code. And this code is available on GitHub. You can have it if you want to play around with it, um, do add bits to it, remove bits to it. In other words, bits meaning you, know, you can change your instance types here. Um, you can change your compute nodes um, here. And you've got your compute nodes here. You've got there's your queue size right there, for example. And you've got your maximum queue size there. Um, this uh, piece of code is written to auto scale which means that you don't have to create a, a code that will launch 10 servers. It depends what you put in your queue. So automatically detect that there's more work coming. You look at the traffic and the, and the, the, the resources are in your queue. And you can use, for example, lots of queues. You've got Open Lava, you've got Scrum. And so it will detect what's in your queue and it will automatically create a new server. So just going back now, as you can see, um, the creation has started on my cluster okay so we're going to let that churn away um, and we're going to carry on so. okay all right then i've lost my uh, mouse About that. Sorry, I can't see my mouse. So let's go back to. Screen. Screen. I know I need to keep the screen. So let's go back there and uh, let's bring it back to me. Come here. There we go, here we go, okay. So, what I did just now when you saw the live demo, I'm gonna create an HPC cluster using the CFA network framework. The code's available on GitHub. Uh, go get it, go play with it. There's lots of documentation online. Um, and if you need help, ping me and I'll, I'll send out more information. But basically, it's really easy to create a, um, a framework because the actual script is available to you. Now, when I've created that cluster, there'll be times when I'll be using it. And so Jolt is key. So here, here, with it is an example from Fermilab, where they actually used uh, these instances and spots for processing high-energy physics data. And you'll notice here um, it, that you've seen the cores at any given time. But you also notice that there's some times when they didn't need that many cores. And so they didn't use them. Um, and, and when they didn't use them, why should you pay for them? So remember, the key to AWS in, in terms of understanding how we provision service is that we only get you to pay for what you use. And so if you think about uh, the, the model of a supercomputer, um, if you buy a supercomputer, you pay everything, right? Just one set of funds and you pay for all the calls, irrespective of whether you use it or not. When you've got a HP cluster, sometimes they're too small, sometimes they're too big. But you're still paying for the capacity. You're still paying for that overhead, you know, the blank bit there, right? And so, you, you know, and then you may also have like peaky workloads going up and down. You have extra calls um, that are so that that um, that you may need, and you may have times when uh, you may need to grow into a workload, for example. So that initial capacity that you see right at the top, uh, you don't pay for that. And if you think about uh, the way we do spots. It's a bit like eBay for CPU cycles. It's monetizing that CPU. So at the top here, you have the spot market. Basically, um, it's all the unused EC2 capacity um, that AWS has, and you can actually bid for that, uh, a bit like, like an auction, basically. And um, it does actually monetize your overhead. Um, you can bid for... for you can bid for CPU cycles for one or two hours or, or longer, just depending on how you've bid. Um, the one thing to remember is that um, 
not everybody pays for this additional capacity, it's just there. Uh, we just we just find a better way of getting rid of that excess capacity for you guys to use and any lowest cost. So going back to the, the pricing models on the left, you've got on-demand instances. Um, if you use that, um, you, you really won't be saving a lot, to be honest. Um, if you use reserve instances, those are for workloads that have got predictability. And for research projects, you don't have that with predictability. You want to run a job right for an hour or two, and then you're done. So then that comes to spot. Um, and, and spot is typically what we're seeing is about 90, 95% of uh, cost reduction in terms of the stick price. So actually it's, it's worth using that. Um, when I do my research, um, I actually use spot instances because I don't really want to pay out as much as you would on an on-demand server. So here's an example. Um, I was actually going to create 120 nodes, but I run out of time writing the script. So basically, um, working out how much it's going to cost you, uh, if you've if you, if you spun up uh, 100 uh, teraflops uh, this platform using Stephen Cluster, for a weekend run, it's going to cost you about 1.3k. Um, and then, if you did that, for, if you did that spin up, sorry, for the weekend and run, and if you did for a weekend run, it's 13k. But if you look at the costings here, you've got 120 nodes, right? Um, you've got over 100.24 um, total performance. You've got 48 hours of simulation, and it's give it's actually costing you a fraction. So. I think, from a perspective of research, this is this is kind of really quite cheap, to be honest. Uh, and and the reason why it's cheap is because you're bidding on servers or capacity that no one else is using. And so, if you look at the mock, and you can really, if if you if you're really good at this, right, you you could actually get your server for. for for 95% less of the sticker price. I mean, you're literally paying peanuts for this. Um, and it's important to understand that if you look at the green bits, those are the ones that are less used. And if, if you've got an account to go on, you'll see that you can actually pick out over a period of time which servers are the law use and use them in your research. Um, it's important to note also, uh, also that when you do your bidding, um, don't forget to change the region because it defaults to Virginia. If you look at EU, which is Dublin, which is where our servers are based, um, it'll probably give you a probability uh, of what might be rescheduled. And you get like a two hour um, alert that your EC2 capacity is going to be taken away from you. But if you go for the ones that say hi, that's going to be taken away because the demand is really high. But if you, if you can create parallel jobs on multiple nodes and use lowest low servers uh, in the green range, then your data is still going to be processed if it's not time critical. And if it's not time critical, you can still use that servers to process your data. Uh, this mark spotted behavior gives you a probability on, on, on an estimate of how much you'll save. And you can do this from the command line as well. And with the command line, you can get really, really uh, nifty. You can exploit this the spot market and we encourage you to do that exploit it as much as you can um, and uh, you, you'll see a lot of benefits if you start to exploit uh, and you can actually list out which service are available you can bid for them and you can see the prices dropping so how do you know how do you control what you're spending online you've got something called the cost explorer it brings up a nice dashboard where you can actually even it shows you how much cost you've got over a timeline and You've also got spending budgeting dashboard, and, and right, you've got a billing and cost management bas dashboard. And you've got time when you show the demo, I'll show you my, uh, if I can access it, my uh, dashboard, which actually shows me how much I'm using over a period of time. That's a good way of controlling your expenditure, knowing how much you're using in terms of your research project. So, choices at the end of the day is, is why. Why would you do this? Well, you can go up and down, so you can run a workload double triple you can go faster so you can you can if any cluster can can go up and down so the cluster i've created all i need is additional update to change the server size and i can it can go up i can change the nodes automatically i can change from 20 to, to, to 30 to 100 to 200 to 250. 
Be aware, though, your account that you have is limited to 20 EC2s, which basically means that if you want to go above that, you need to, you need to give us an email saying you know, what you're trying to accomplish. If you want to um, execute like 300 nodes, for example, let us know that you're going to do that. It's called a limit increase in your VPC. So once you let us know, within an hour or so, you've got that limit and you can go and play as much as you want. Um, and the savings are quite astronomical. Uh, and the reason why, and I, I, I'm not saying that because I'm with AWS, right? Well, I do, but it's also because I've benefited from the research I've done because, as you know, we're a business as well. We need to keep our costs low. And so I've pocketed, not personally pocketed, but my department's pocketed about 80% savings in terms of using spots. But you really need to understand spots uh, and understand it, play with it, see how low you can go. It can get, it is fun to actually use spot because you can see the prices changing over a period of time. Any questions? I think I've kind of bored you, haven't I? <laughs> um, we're nearly finished. This is the last slide, I promise you, right? So, earlier I mentioned that, you know, one of my remits is to encourage and accelerate cloud adoption in the UK and EMEA. Well, we also have partners, and so I manage some of these partners as well, and try and create alliances with them. And so, uh, we we have a, a huge ecosystem of partners, uh, software tools. And so, if you look at the left column, um, those are basically our independent service vendors, uh, and they provide us with um, the ISVs. Second column is our technology. The third column, Univer, for example, is our complementary products like the Universe Agile, for example. And last one is our integration. So the CFN cluster framework, uh, we've worked with Cycle Computing and NICE to get the framework in place for HPC processing. Um, so some of the, the common schedulers that we have available, and this might ring some bells, Grid Engine, PBS, uh, Open Lava. Um, we have um, a Born in the Cloud, which is Cycle Computing. And then we've got tools such as CloudFormation. I don't have that lot of time to go with CloudFormation, cloud formation, but I'll be around all day. So if you want to come and pick my brain, by all means do. And so let's go and have a look at our cluster. So let's go back. And so we're still creating in progress. And so command line. Right, still creating. So I want to show you now. So we have been speaking for 10 minutes, by the way. So we're nearly done, actually, in terms of the creation. So we're going to go to EC2. And there you see, it's not a big cluster. I've just got my master. I've got um, two compute nodes, right? So we go back to services and cloud formation and look at my outputs. And then you have so a few more minutes to go. It usually takes about uh, 15 minutes just depends. Um, but the cluster can be done in about 15 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, depending on what you're launching. And so once, you, once your, your cluster is complete, it's ready to go. It's ready with the tool sets. Um, if you launch it with the ALSYS, it'll come with the full tool sets that you would need for any simulation, for any modeling. So it just depends what you use. And in this case, I've just used a, HG, um, a CFN cluster to, to create the nodes. And, oh, DB. Okay, so let's go in. So lastly, just so you know what I've done. Okay. It's basically I've created this in the cloud. So I've created a, a master compute node. And 
that node, that code that I created, it creates two basic nodes, right, with a master. And as you schedule jobs and it goes into the queue, and if that, those jobs exceed the capacity of that node, it will automatically generate another node, and then another node. And my maximum is 10. So it, it's up to me, basically, how fast I want to create my cluster. If I just want to limit myself to 10, I'll leave it to 10. But it depends on your job. If your job is trying time critical, obviously you're going to create more nodes. If your job isn't time critical, then you won't. But remember also that you can use the server the, from a spot market as well. And so it might be good to watch that behavior and gain more um, cost reduction. Okay. And finally, before we end, I think I've actually done my 60 minutes on time. Well, uh, some resources for GitHub, um, all the code base is there. Uh, and you, you can download the cluster tools and just play around. Um, again, upgrade, downgrade your cluster, um, see what you can do with it. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.